Welcome, everybody, once again to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. This is episode number 49, and it surprises me to say that out loud. Uh, before I uh, get started today on the podcast, I want to talk about something. Uh, I found this piece of paper the other day. Now, uh, if if you know me, you know that I, I'm, I'm, I'm a note taker. Uh, I, I, I take notes about everything constantly. But what I liked about this note was this is... Uh, this was my little uh, sheet that I used at the RKC2, the second level of the uh, kettlebell certifications, when we came out to the area on ballistic overhead work. There's two exercises, the kettlebell um, push press and the kettlebell push jerk. And when we do the RKC2 or, or any of the advanced certs, I always run into a big issue right away. I'll, I'll talk about the issue real quick and then move on. A couple of years ago, Somebody emailed me with the, the new schedule and they said, you know, so proudly, well, what do you think? And I said, well, you know, as the team leader, you're asking me to put my group through 14 different tests in a two or three day period. And now it's just two. Well, testing people on 14 t different movements and some of them were redundant, yes, but one of them was the five minute snatch test, which is five minutes for every participant. Um, pull ups, uh, we had a pistol in there. We had all kinds of, we had a whole bunch of non kettlebell exercises. And I just thought, you know, you're asking me to not only teach for two days, but also judge a decathlon, well, actually more than a decathlon, over the two day period. I'm still a believer that the advanced kettlebell cert should only have two tests. Uh, and this we talked about this back well over a decade ago. And they're the two tests uh, that set you up in the book, Enter the Kettlebell. Uh, the idea is this. There's, there's two things you should do. Now, I'm going to use them for the male standards. And the female are just a little different. But in a 10-minute period, you should be able to snatch the 24-kilo bell 200 times. And then, and I think you should be able to do both in a half an hour period, press half body weight with one hand overhead. And so for most of the men I work with, that would be the beast. So you snatch the 24 200 times in 10 minutes and then press the beast. And people said, well, that's really hard. And I thought, yeah, it's really hard, but it would show that you were, you, you had a high level of strength, endurance, and throwing every other word you want to throw in. Uh, obviously, my simple solution uh, was passed over. But when we get to these certs, we have a lot of these exercises we teach. And I spend a lot of time before I teach everyone with the section I called mythos, uh, which is the why of things. Why do you do this exercise? And what's interesting is that this is my sheet right here for the overhead ballistic work. Uh, and it starts off with mythos, the why. Th the first thing I always ask people to do, if, if you have a client or yourself, if you can't do kettlebell swings because of whatever reason and or you cannot do uh, Turkish get-ups uh, with one arm in uh, uh, on with both arms both sides we shouldn't even be discussing anything ballistic or anything overhead yet uh, if you have an injured back I don't want to see you doing ballistic overhead work if your knees are bad I don't want to see you doing ballistic overhead work if it hurts for you to roll on the ground for a moment, maybe we don't want to do ballistic overhead work. So I put this little matrix in here. Uh, if you can do swings and, and Turkish get-ups right and left, then I say, and it says yes, then the next question is this. Do you need ballistic overhead work? And there's a good question. Because if you don't, like if you're an NFL football player who's getting plenty of... Uh, uh, ballistic work in the game or you're uh, in a, a, a other different sports where maybe overhead stability isn't your best thing, I would still say no. Now, if you're at the cert and you're required to do it because of testing, then we would say yes. So I always put these little matrices for my students in the beginning because one of the things I think we don't always do when it comes to exercises is... I mean, it's, it's a cliche as old as I am. I mean, older than, older than the mountains. You got to look before you leap. So one of the things when you do bring in new exercises to your clients or to your own training program, 
always take a moment to ask that why question. Well, I always do that. And one of the things I'm constantly trying to do is come up with better ways to come up with the why question. Uh, if you know my work, I'm not a huge fan of the phrase either or. But when it comes to exercise selection, I like that a lot. If you want to do my Olympic lifting programs, uh, really, there's a big first one. Do you have an Olympic lifting bar? Because if you don't, you can't do them. I hate to be so either or so binary, but that's just the way it goes. When we come to working with the more advanced lifts in the world of barbells or the kettlebells, hey, and it'd be true in gymnastics and every other thing we do, there are times you have to stop and say, do we have the equipment? Do we have the knowledge? If you go to the university and go to the workout generator, you'll find we have five or six questions on, on, on this. And then there's that other one is, do you need to do this exercise? And I got to tell you, folks, that's the one that I have been probably pushing the most in the last few decades. Yes, it's a great exercise, but do you need to do it? Are there simpler, safer things you can do besides this? Uh, I remember years ago, I wouldn't say we got into a fight, but I got into a disagreement with a, with a, a fellow track coach who felt that the entire track program should be doing plyometrics. And of course, I, I cited the research about plyometrics. I shared my experiences with plyos. And, and frankly, uh, with a lot of the kids we have in the modern high school, uh, they need much lower end stuff than plyometrics. Many of them are carrying a lot of excess tissue on their body, and it's not muscle. And, um, you know, doing box jumps with uh, an obese athlete, I don't see that as a good thing. And it was interesting because this assistant coach wanted to go right up to the, some of the most elite techniques in track and field and was skipping over the basics like appropriate techniques, like this... Uh, th this coach's athletes weren't doing uh, full turns in the discus, which, of course, is a big deal. They were doing standing throws in the javelin, which is a big deal. All the plyometrics in the world aren't nearly as good as having proper technique. So it's a thought I want you to uh, run with a little bit. I want you to think about the why of your exercise selection sometimes. And if you can... Find appropriate other things to do that might fit where you are now. I always say this. I, in fact, last week I was Olympic lifting again. I'm very proud of that at my age. Um, but now when I Olympic lift, it's the cherry on top of a number of weeks of building up my my joints, flex, uh, my joint mobility, my flexibility, my capacity to handle the Olympic lifts. And then I do them again for a while. And then I get away from them and bring back other things and bring myself back to the Olympic lifts. I think it's intelligent. I think it's appropriate. And it's something I can do for a long, long time. I hope this helps. Okay, we have a question from Connor. Connor says, I would love to know your advice on building lower body hypertrophy for someone, me, with reoccurring lower back issues. I initially heard it two years ago, demonstrated a back end to a client, cold, very smart. Thank you for saying that yourself. Since then, I've struggled to back squat, front squat, and deadlift decent weight without pain. Wow, Connor, um, you, you really are going to have an issue here. Um, generally, I wouldn't say the following, but in your case, it might be something we need to, to look at. But Connor... Um, when I was rehabbing in 11, uh, 2011, uh, the apartment complex my wife and I were living in, in Burlingame, had a really nice set of weightlifting machines. And even though I know leg extensions are bad for you and I, leg curls are bad for you and leg presses are bad for you, where I was at the time, they were perfect for me. Uh, I was doing sets of 8 to 15 on them. I was getting a pump. I was feeling good. And very quickly, I noticed that I was getting some of that, uh, uh, the muscle back in my quads and hamstrings and, and even, even somewhat up into my butt. The leg press isn't a great glute exercise, as I understand it. But 
you might have put yourself in a situation, Connor, that uh, for your lower body, body hypertrophy, um, maybe you'd like to look into machines a little bit. Um, there is an exercise called the Bulgarian split squat, or it's got a bunch of letters, the rear foot elevator or something like that. I don't know why we have to have acronyms in this in this field for everything. It drives me crazy. But the rear foot elevated uh, split squat, for many people, puts no pressure on their lower back. Um, the thing I come away with is this. You hurt this two years ago, uh, and it's still bothering you now. Um, I, I don't want to give you medical advice, but I, I would like you to get this looked at. Um, I, I wish you could go see my friend Stu McGill and get a, get a look at it. But uh, two years is a long time for a back injury. Now, as a thrower, I mean, you kind of always live right on the razor's edge of, you know, getting back issues because, you know, all the torque and twisting that we do uh, and, and some of the idiocy that we do. But two years is a long time. I, I would like you to do, to think about the machines to think about the split squats, but also let's get that looked at, okay? And I'd like you to get back to me on this. Thank you, Connor. Gary writes us, question one, I can overhead press my 24 kilo bell with both hands while standing. I've tried it kneeling, but it's not pretty. What is the purpose of the kneeling press? Well, if you're talking about both knees on the ground, uh, I don't do them, but uh, one of the things it does do is teach you the, the correct, it, it teaches you correct posture. It teaches you to keep, you know, to st now your, now your knees have to become your feet, your, your hips have to become your knees and you have to have a better position. I only do half kneeling presses. That's pressing with just one knee on the ground uh, and the other one in kind of the lunge position. Um, for, for me, the reason I like the half kneeling so much is it's one of the best hip flexor stretches I know. But you have to have your pelvic bowl under your rib cage box. You have to be stacked up. You, you can't lean away. You can't cheat. By taking that leg off, I'm forcing you to have a, a great symmetry and great structure. So that's why I like it. Um, sometimes you'll find a weightlifting movement like the half kneeling press where the, the exercise does all the coaching. Um, I feel the same way about the overhead squat. The exercise does all the coaching for me. <laughs> if, the ball, if the bar falls off, you're, you're like, yeah, yeah, you drop the bar. I mean, I don't have to say that to you. It's pretty obvious to everybody in the gym and maybe the neighborhood too. So um, I like it because inside the exercise itself, uh, you're getting the corrections. Question number two from Gary. As someone who wants to learn to barbell snatch in the future, how do I appropriately learn to overhead squat? Right now, mine is not adequate, even with the broomstick. Well, I, I would love to see you just jump in and start doing the, the snatch, but the system I use is real simple. Um, you put a broomstick at your feet, you take a, a kettlebell, you squat down at the bottom, you push your knees out, okay? Curl the weight to the ground, in that position, you pick up the uh, the stick, the broomstick, whatever, put it over your head, stand up, sit back down, squat back down, put the stick to the ground, curl the weight up with your elbows in the, the knees, curl it up, stand up. So that's one rep. And you can work up to sets of three or five on that. Uh, the coaching I do on this exercise is basically this. For those of you listening, I just covered my mouth uh, because I want the movement to inform the, the athlete. Uh, just like the, uh, it, it's funny, you said overhead squat, uh, maybe I saw it or something, but uh, those two exercises are, the exercise coaches the athlete and I can just stand there and, and watch. Um, I know I have, I put this on my Instagram account. Oh, it'd be about two months ago, the exercise, I have Jeffrey Hemingway doing it. Um, if you want to go back into my archives on Instagram, or maybe I can, uh, we can pop it up on a, a YouTube or something for you. I hope that helps, Gary. Thank you. We have a question from Tim. Once you have achieved a certain level of muscle mass, is it relatively easy to keep it even when you're not lifting to anything like the same intensity? 
if you earned it the right way, Tim, that stuff sticks around. Uh, I am always a little amazed at, like when I'll take months off for travel or whatever, um, obviously I, you don't really lose strength very much. You know, you'll come back within a, a day or two, but the size stays. But this is what Dick Notmeyer taught me back in 1975. Honest built muscles stay forever. Um, and now if you decide to use anabolic steroids or testosterone or something like that, or whatever the, whatever the pill of the day is, I don't know. That stuff doesn't seem to stay, but if you go old school, you know, three days a week, do your lifts, you know, eat your protein, sleep, that stuff sticks around for a while. Um, sometimes people notice how, how large my arms are. Uh, and if you know me, I don't do any arm work at all, but the size, I mean, the, the size stays. Um, I have been consciously trying to bring down my size, uh, now that I'm in my 60s, uh, the, the load, the, my body weight load isn't something that's going to help me with my longevity. Uh, also, too, if I when I do compete, uh, I can't this year because of COVID, but um, the implements in the, in the seniors or master games are so light, I don't need to be strong at all to throw them far. So I am consciously trying to bring down my muscle mass and... This is going to sound crazy. Well, what I just said is actually crazy because you should never do that. But it, I have found it a little bit harder to get the body to let go of some of the, you know, like the huge legs and stuff. Uh, it, it's just funny to say that out loud because, you know, everyone's chasing muscle mass and I'm doing kind of the opposite. Uh, I'm doing it really for my, my long-term health and, and because, you know, you don't want to weigh... 300 pounds in your 60s it's not a good idea and and, it, and it's great to have you know huge pythons and you know titanic trapezius and shoulder boulders or you know whatever uh, i don't read the bodybuilding magazines like i used to but yeah it will stay on a long time it's a gift that just keeps on giving in the same way tim it's interesting though uh if you decide in your teens and 20s to maintain a very lean physique, that lean physique will stay around much easier in your 30s, 40s, and 50s. So it works on both sides. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Daniel. What dumbbell training routine would you recommend during these challenging times? Well, my biggest issue with dumbbells always, Daniel, is that they're either too light or they're too heavy. Um, it is like the opposite of the Goldilocks story. But one of the things I do like is if you can go online and find the, the writings of Istvan Javorek, J-A-V-O-R-E-K. He has a number, a number of dumbbell circuit workouts that I always thought were pretty good. Um, you know, uh, I'm a big believer in complexes and circuit training. And one of the things he did was he would put together up to 20 different movements in a circuit all using the same exact dumbbells. And I, I think there's great, there's some great wisdom in that. Um, I've never done exclusive dumbbell training. Um, it was not something, I don't know if we just, I just missed it in my career, or maybe it was the gyms I went to never had enough dumbbells, but I've never done a lot of just dumbbell work. There would have been a period in 78 uh, towards the end of that concussion uh, when I was kind of recovering, when I did a lot of dumbbell work, um, Dick Dick advised me to do a lot of incline dumbbell presses and things like that. Uh, I'm 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 looking back now with kind of a blank memory because I, I'm a, my memory's not very good from that period, but you can get a lot of work out of dumbbells. Um, I think one of the great secrets of the dumbbell is the idea of putting them on the ground and picking them up for presses, putting them on the ground, picking them up to your chest, laying back on the bench and doing the dumbbell bench press, putting them on the ground, picking them up and doing the next exercise. To me, the value of dumbbell work has always been the idea is you put them back on the floor and so you have to pick them up and go. Um, I don't have a ton of, of ideas for you, Daniel, because it's not my, it's not my best area, but I'm sure online you can find a dozen different things. Um, the old York 
courses, Y-O-R-K. Had a couple of good dumbbell programs, but basically, I'm going to tell you to do the same things you always do. You know, pick them up, put them overhead, pick them up and curl them, pick them up and roll them, pick them up and just do stuff. Um, you'll probably get more reps than you think, and you'll probably quickly outpace the load on your, on your dumbbells. So thank you. All right, we have a question from Michael. What are your thoughts on unbalanced farmer walks? Um, so basically you have different loads. Um, the late, great Lane Cannon and I, uh, he taught me an interesting thing. He would go to garage sales and pick up dumbbells. So when you worked out at his house, uh, it's interesting, two dumbbell questions back to back. Uh, we used to do uh, bench presses with his dumbbells. And, you know, you'd have... 45 in this hand and 85 in this hand and you do a set like this the next set switch and do it like that and I discovered an interesting thing is that uh, load is load and your body has an amazing ability to adjust to anything so when you're asking about unbalanced farmer walks when you have uh, uh, different loads in both hands uh, I think it's great especially if that's all you have um, it would be interesting to see how, how you fail on these is it the heavier grip or is it the the, the body uh, fighting to maintain its center I, I think I think it's a great idea I, I don't do them but I think it's a kind of an interesting idea also are you still a fan of the slosh pipe carries well of course yeah um, the slosh pipe the way we use it especially uh, is part of a, a total training system and what you want to use the slosh pipe for is to get a it, it, it gives the athlete a really hard workout centering the body as the as the water goes back and forth but the nice thing about it is is that the weight was 38 pounds I think is that it was real hard to hurt anybody and it was always fun to watch the athlete just th their faces would turn you know their faces would turn beet red as they were holding on for dear life, as they were fighting to get it back. And you can have this, you know, you do three slosh pipe carries, and every and the athlete can walk away after those three slosh pipe carries and be like, oh, that was fun, and not even think about the hit that it just had on their, on their, on their core, on their anaconda strength. So, yeah, I, I'm always going to be a big, a, fan, a big fan of the slosh pipe carry. Um, in my own home gyms, I've had a real hard time keeping them from breaking because, frankly, um, oddly, the guests to my house, to my home gym, don't take care of the equipment well like I would like them to do. Um, the other day I was telling the story about how how this person, actually a famous name, broke one of my uh, kind of expensive uh, Scottish hammers when I asked the person during their swings two, three, four times to stop, stop, stop. And of course, the person kept doing it, hitting the ground, and then it broke the head off. Um, but for whatever reason, I can't get people to take good care of my slosh pipes. So every time I make one, uh, it breaks, and I never do the breaking. So be careful if you want to keep them around for a while. Thank you. Cody asks, you mentioned changing exercise selection every two weeks during the four-day program, if you want. Remember, I give you a number of options there, so let's, but we'll focus here. I went from the prescribed deadlift and press to jerk and hang cleans, and now on to deadlift snatch and front squat using only one set of deadlift, single snatching by feel and front squat two by five. All accessory work uh, has stayed the same. Any thoughts on this if it's too much? Um, yeah, Cody, I, I mean, the idea on the 40 day program is is you just keep coming in and doing the work. Um, whether, if it's too much, you would know because uh, when you finish, um, there's a thing called PRE. Uh, it's your perceived rate of exertion, okay? And people think, and I think this is wrong, is that every workout should be a 10. You should be a vomiting, sweaty mess when you leave. And you can get away with that for a while. Uh, probably months maybe even a year, year and a half, but your body and your brain are going to rebel. I like to keep the rate of exertion 
well, in easy strength out of five, a six, or seven. When you finish the workout, you should be able to go, huh, yeah, I could do that again right now. I actually feel pretty good. And that's how you want to feel. The idea with easy strength is to keep coming back in, or 40 day workout, is to keep coming back in every day. Uh, there's a Reddit thread on easy strength, and the one person finally one person finally figured it out. If you're doing two sets of five, five days a week, that's 10 sets of five. That's a lot of volume. And I'm like, yeah, I said that a thousand times, but, and all of a sudden everybody understood it. The idea is you're trying to build up volume in, in the 40 day workout by keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back and build that volume up that way. Um, the only person you're going to say if it's too much, Cody, is you. If, if you feel like you're, uh, you know, burning the candle at both ends, it's too much. But if you feel at the end of every workout, yeah, that feels good. And what I like the best is when I know I'm doing it right, is when, I, is when I'm done with the workout, if I got this little hunger, you know, like, yeah, yeah, I know I could do more than that. That's what I like the best. That's when I know I've nailed the workouts, is when I can't wait to come back tomorrow and do it again with more weight. I hope that helped. Bo asks a question. It's interesting because I have the same issue. When gripping the kettlebell with both hands for swings, my pinky fingers hang off the sides. My hands cannot both fit in the grip. This makes my grip a little awkward and it gives out earlier than it should. Do I need to search and find kettlebells with wider grips? Uh, it is a problem with some kettlebells, Bo. I have the same issue. Um, with my 24 kilo bells, I can fit both uh, hands in there comfortably. With my 28s, no problem at all. With the 32s, 36s, and 48s, no problem. But when I get to the 20s, and especially if I try a 16, then it becomes an issue and I have to have my pinkies on the outside. Now, the upside of this is this, it's only 16 or 20 kilos, so and I, just, I can crush the weight with just uh, three fingers and thumbs on there. Uh, I'm just saying that I, there is no answer uh, I don't want you to go out and buy new kettlebells. I just want you to adjust somehow. Uh, I think it's perfectly fine to let the pinkies be on the outside. Um, it, it is strange. You do lose a little bit of grip, but you'll notice really over time, Bo, you're not going to lose very much at all. Um, that's not much of an answer, but it's the reality of the piece of equipment. Thank you, Bo. William, I'm trying to ask about my dad. He's 63 years old, so probably... 1957 birth, 1975 high school graduation, just like me. Newly retired and 300 pounds. His diet is crap and his body is starting to fall apart. Knee pain, back pain, etc. etc. In your experience, what has worked well convincing people to take the big steps needed to pursue health? That's William, I gotta thank you for your honesty and candor about your father. Um, sadly, you know, and I, I'm, and I have a new book coming out called Attempts. And I talk about the lessons I picked up from uh, Tony Robbins um, with his pain pleasure thing. And if you don't mind, I'd like you to read some of my work on pain and pleasure. But really the motivator for most people, it has to be something painful, like going to the funeral of a, a dear friend, uh, some really serious, oh my God, uh, health scare, uh, to convince people to turn it around. Um, my goal, and I'm the same age as your dad, is the dance at Josephine, my granddaughter's wedding. Um, every single diet and exercise decision I make and recovery decision is based around the fact that I want to be around a little bit longer. Um, there will be pleasure dancing at Josephine's wedding, but there's going to be a lot more pain if I'm not there. Um, let me follow up on the rest of the question. I realize I can't make him do anything he doesn't want to do, but is there some kindling I could be laying in case he has a spark? Yeah, you know, goal setting is tough, but... Can you have an honest conversation about, you know, Dad, what do you want? Uh, I know, uh, I'm not, this isn't medical advice, but at 300 pounds, much of his knee pain and back pain can be cured by having less load on them. But 
you know, he ha- you ha- if you had an honest conversation, and I got to tell you, it's tough. You know, I, I got a friend who's obviously, obviously drinking too much. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just not there with the intervention yet. I, I don't know what to do. I don't have the courage to pull it off. But can you talk to him honestly about how you feel and maybe what you need to do, what he needs to do? It, this diet is crap thing, we've got to turn that around. Um, you know, we need, you need to have some kind of dietary intervention and I, I, I don't have the skill set to help you. Um, if any of my listeners can help me help you, I'd really appreciate it. And William, why don't you get back to me in a week or so and I'll see if I can get any information for you. Thank you. Okay, I've got a question from Timothy. I have a question about fasting. Yeah, don't eat. A uh, little joke. Shift work and post-workout nutrition. I work from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. I used to do that shift. Shift, And I'm incorporating 16-8 intermittent fasting. A normal day for me is waking up at 5.30 p.m. Oh, that's not bad. Eating dinner with my family at 6. Leaving for work about 8.30 eating again at 1.30, and training at 8.30 a.m. How important is post-workout nutrition? Is it okay to train and stay in a fasted state till 6? Well, actually, you're yeah, the way you're doing it, it works out. <laughs> Basically, it'd be like me um, uh, eating dinner and then doing a workout and then waking up the next day. Timothy, I think you have a nice little solution to this. Yeah, I would... Uh, the longer... Well, I just, in fact, I just read a good article about this. It's by Marty Gallagher at Raw, R-A-W, Iron Company. And he talked about how uh, many great bodybuilders uh, figured out that doing a fasted cardio workout seemed to help them long term. And then some of them realized, especially getting ready for contests, at night after their last meal, they would do a cardio workout. A boring treadmillish uh, concept two row, or you know, you know the drill, uh, or go for a walk, and then go to bed. And when they wake, woke up, do another fasted cardio workout with the idea that I burned all my sugars at that evening workout after my meal. Then I fasted, and now whatever I'm burning now has to be fat. Now I've been at workshops where people have said that what I just said was a bunch of nonsense. But you can't argue that the modern bodybuilder looks a lot better than the early 60s bodybuilders. Um, so, and I'm not just talking about the heavy drug ones. I'm talking about even the naturals. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think this is a good idea. I like I like your approach. What really makes me happy is the fact that you have a chance to eat dinner with your family every night. Um, that that's that's great. I hope you have some quality time. Um, this week's Wandering Weights talks about life you know you juggle you juggle five balls um one of them is a rubber ball and the rubber ball is your work and the other four are glass balls and that's things like your family your friends and you know those kinds of things and the only ball you don't have to worry about dropping is work so uh, the fact that you you eat dinner with your family uh really encourages me and good luck on this i think you're doing fine um do it for a bit and then get back to me and let me know how things are, are, are trending, okay? Thank you. Okay, I've got a question from Jeffrey. I'm a police officer and an operator on the SWAT team. I work with a lot of SWAT teams. In order to get onto a team, the fitness requirements made it such that aerobic capacity and muscle endurance were much more important for selection, and my training reflected that. Now that I've been on the team for a while, and I know where this is going, I find that absolute strength and adding some muscle mass armor building are more important. I've also leaned out a lot as our team works out together and does a lot of stair running, Tabata style, and HIIT workouts that I participate in at work almost daily. I've read your book, Mass Made Simple, and want to try the program, but the fact is I can't take that many rest days. Still have to work out with a team and can't afford to be really sore at work on an operation makes it very difficult. How would you recommend I go about adding some lean body mass into the condition? <clears throat> I wouldn't recommend it at all. Um, you know, as long as you're the, you literally your life is on the line, um, you know, 
doing that high rep set of squats might might slow you down enough that uh, you you become a target. And I don't want that, uh, Jeffrey. Um, one of the problems we have with special forces and, and, and operators is the guy, you guys always do too much. Um, and you don't do enough that's uh, related to training. One of the things that when I worked with uh, one of my first teams is they did a, uh, they did a practice and at the practice, they had about a third of their people get injured at some level. And when I went in there, I started talking. And uh, one of the first things I said is, you know, how often do you sit in your full gear um, in a kneeling position behind a fence for 45 minutes? And the one guy said, well, we never do that. I said, well, it's interesting because the one guy who got hurt was a very, very hot day, full battle dress, uh, on his knees behind a fence and then jumped up and sprinted and pulled a hamstring muscle or whatever muscle he pulled. Well, if you're going to be in your gear on a hot day and then have to leap up and do something, yeah, you're going to get hurt. What I would, re I, so what I recommended to them was what we, I used to call lift and offs and now I call them lift and off. So it's workouts where you combine a hinge or a squat followed by sprinting. You do squats, then you sprint instantly. You throw the weight down and sprint. You do deadlifts, sprint. You do deadlifts and bear crawl, which is great for American football and rugby. So the idea of building lean body mass, for me, the most important things I think you should do are focus on work capacity, which is the loaded carry family, bear hugs, and, and bear crawls, um, farmer walks, sled pulls, prowlers, and then working your hinge. Because if you have to if you have to hit somebody, that's the deadlifts, the snatches, and the cleans. Uh, you guys are athletes on SWAT teams. Now, yes, you also need a, a some level of, of lean body mass. So the bulk of your workout should be the hinge hinge work and loaded carry work, which is the work capacity. But you also need to spend about three days a week doing push, pull, and squat. And one rule here: all your now, what you, all your reps and sets have to be the exact same number, end up at the same number. Most of you guys are going to do 200 pushes, 10 pulls, and 5 squats, and I don't want that. What I'd like to see you have is, at the end of the week when you add up all your numbers, that you have something like 75 pushes, 75 pulls, 75 squats. So that's 5 sets of 5, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You could do three sets of eight. You could do three sets of five, five sets of three. It doesn't matter. But for lean body mass, push, pull, and hinge the same numbers. See if you can string together a workout for me that has some of that lean body work. By the way, at first I would do go right to three sets of eight. Just make it as boring as simple as possible. Three sets of eight in the overhead press, three sets of eight in the pull-up, three sets of eight in the back squat. And then slowly add some different exercises and, and rep schemes into that. And then the rest of your work is swings, snatches, cleans, deadlifts, one of those, and some kind of loaded carries. Once a week, the squat or hinge followed by the sprints. And uh, that's my advice to you, and I hope it helps. Lee asks, how do you recommend incorporating cardio work on off days with strength training? Do they hold each other back? Is there an ideal mix of the two? Uh, Lee, you're, you've tied into a, 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 an issue that we've been running into in this field for a couple of years. And it's, and it's a false dichotomy, big phrase. Is that you have on one end strength and you have on the other end endurance. And that's just not the way the world works. You, you mix them constantly. Uh, when people go back to the hunter-gatherer paradigm and uh, they, they, they say all these things. But the, or I just had a question from a SWAT guy or American football and you know, trying to get the endurance that you need in American football is really different than jogging a mile. Um, so the, the, the biggest thing, Lee, is you didn't give me enough information, but cardio work to me should not be something else. Uh, I believe in what we call seamless training, S-E-A-M, seamless training, where it's it, when you're watching me train someone, you can't tell if we're doing mobility, flexibility, strength, power, endurance, or whatever, is that the workout is seamless. Uh, I get, I like working cardio in 
by doing um, complexes, by doing the 30, 30 for 30 workouts, where the, the entire time the athletes in the gym, they're, they're training, they're either, they're either doing an exercise, doing a stretch, doing mobility. When they do rest, they purely rest and then they get back into it with these constant bursts of energy in all these different directions. My post-deployment program, one of the one of the bits of feedback I've gotten on it is that, you know, uh, that's where we mix uh, an original strength movement with a loaded carry with a lift, uh, push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded carry. All five of those, you're doing three things for every single movement. And one of the bits of feedback I'm getting is it's the best cardio conditioners these guys have ever done because when you're on the ground doing neck nods and then you pop up and you do uh, a suitcase carry and then you walk over and do deadlifts um, and you just keep circling that through, that's where you get your cardio work in. If you're a long distance runner, then your cardio work is paramount and you come in for some extra strength work for me. Um, is there an ideal way to mix the two? Um, well, Percy Cerruti uh, had some great ideas back in the 50s and 60s on this. Uh, track and field is based on this question. Um, the ideal mix is <laughs> tell me what you want and then we'll figure out <laughs> what the mix will be for you. You know, as a thrower, um, I used to not think I needed very much cardio until I realized that, you know, when I'm doing 500 turns a day in drills and throwing, there is a level of, you know, of ticker that you need to keep going. And that's when I changed a few things. So every sport is going to be, you'll be on that, that fake continuum of endurance to strength, but it never means that it's either or. It's going to be both and swum through. Well, I hope you learned something today. Uh, remember, if you have questions, and we do our best to answer all of them, but some of them... Uh, lately have been a bit obscure, uh, please send your questions to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com and we'll look them over and we'll do our best to answer each and every one. Thank you.